Today's message is from Luke 15, 1 through 10. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep, losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Jesus, so, or just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she finds it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over sinners, over one sinner who repents. So I wore my purple shirt today for Merkel, ACU, TCU, Wiley, I don't know who it's for. It's a purple shirt, though. I really wore it because I want to tell a story that Alan Mawson loves to tell. When we were kids, we were, we were, uh, we were trendsetters, man. We were out there on the edge, you know. Uh, before Chevy Chase was doing his falling down thing, we fell down all over town, man. We walk in a grocery store and we were just falling all over the place. But Alan's favorite story was, um, you know, I, I, I was a little bit of an annoying kid. I, I, I would walk up to you in the store not knowing you, and I'd start trying to pick at you, and so. So I would walk up to people at Westgate Mall. How many of you remember Westgate Mall? And I'd walk up to people over there and I'd say, excuse me, have you seen my dinosaur? I'm looking for my dinosaur. Sometimes I'd have a little microphone. Would, would you, have you seen this dinosaur? There's been a sighting and I'm looking for my purple dinosaur. And Alan is sure that somebody crossed paths with us and then created the character Barney years later. But... But we'd go all over the place, and I'd just pester people. You know, I'd, I would describe my purple dinosaur. I want to know if you have seen my dinosaur. Fred Craddock used to do a sermon about the communion service. And he would say, you know, that bag lady that you see walking all over town, the woman in the dirty clothes, and her hair is disheveled, and she's... She's a mess, and she's walking up to people, and she's asking the question, have you seen Gladys? Have you seen Gladys? And he car- she carries the picture that she shows them. You see, Gladys is her daughter, and the bag lady is someone's mother, very concerned and desperate to find her daughter. She's given up her entire life to go from one town to the next carrying a single picture and asking every person that she can stop and get their attention, have you seen my daughter? You know why you do that? You do it because of the value of what's lost. You give away your whole life to do it because of how much what you're looking for means to you. Have you seen Gladys? Have you seen... My daughter, you see them. Their pictures are on telephone poles, utility poles, and their pictures are on milk cartons. Now, Luke is talking to us today about something that he's been trying for several chapters now to frame up, and that is the cost of discipleship. Luke has been presenting a Jesus to us who says to us in previous chapters, before you build, count the cost. Because you don't want to get part of the way through the project and have to stop and people will look and say, what a foolish person who didn't stop to think before he started the project. Luke has even said, when you throw a banquet, Don't just invite people who repay you, but invite the poor, the marginalized. So in terms of the cost of discipleship, it got me to thinking about 
when I worked in the grocery business, and I worked in the meat market, and that's one of the high profit margin areas in the grocery business, and so they paid a lot of attention in the market like they do in all parts of the grocery store to this thing called shrinkage. Have you heard that term? My grocery friends are nodding, going, yeah, I know what shrinkage is. It's preached to you in the grocery business. You keep your shrinkage down. Shrinkage is simply the amount of product that you're going to lose, the amount of profit that you're going to surrender in an attempt to make a profit. You know the old saying, it takes money to make money, and it does. So now we're confronted with Jesus who... In Luke's gospel is asking this question of the Pharisees and, and those who draw near to criticize him for eating with the marginalized. And he asks this question, who among you, who among you doesn't leave 99 sheep and go off in search of one that has wandered away? Do you get the sarcasm and the question? Who among you doesn't leave at risk the greater part of your fortune to go and reclaim the smaller part that you seem to have lost? Who among you doesn't risk everything in order to reclaim a little shrinkage? Now, I'm not a rancher, but I, I, I don't know. My, my, at least my commentary suggested that, that a great rancher may already know you're going to lose a steer or two a lamb or two, a goat or two, I'm not sure what that looks like. I've never had to make those decisions. But you almost hear Jesus' question falling in a certain way on the ears of the Pharisees who would certainly, in a utilitarian way, prior to any such thought, say, but we cannot risk the greater good of these people for one, can we? You've got to count the cost. It's like, it's like Luke is saying, if you're going to be in ministry, if you're going to be a rancher, you've got to count the cost. If you're going to be in ministry, folks, you're going to get your feelings hurt. If you're going to be in ministry, you're going to lose a laptop along the way. You can trust me on that. If you're going to be in ministry, you may lose money. You may be called upon even to die from day to day, from agenda to agenda, or perhaps even to pay the ultimate price. Well, okay, I get it. You look for a fortune. You look for something that's really valuable. You sell it all to find it, but you don't look for a penny. You don't look for a dime. You don't look for something that's that worthless, do you? You don't scour the whole house. For one coin when you have nine more, do you? Well, you might. I mean, there was a time when I didn't care. There was a time when I wouldn't pick up a penny because I thought it's not worth bending over to get. But then stop and think. I wouldn't search my couch for a dime unless I was ten cents short, having enough for a gallon of milk and my baby needed to go to sleep. Or I wouldn't search the back seat of the car for a dime unless I needed one more dime for a Big Mac or a Happy Meal or a six-pack of beer or a pack of cigarettes. Let me promise you something. If you're 10 cents short getting a pack of cigarettes and you're a smoker, you'll turn every piece of furniture in the house upside down to find that dime. The Bible says that the woman who recovered that one coin through a party called her friends and celebrated that she had found one coin. Now, once upon a time, I went out to get gas with, with a, a young man who was part of this congregation and I was visiting with his folks and I was giving him a ride somewhere and we were just talking and having such a great visit that I stopped and, and I had a van that had two tanks at the time and I, and I filled up both tanks and this will tell you it's been a couple of days ago because I think it was about 40 or $50 in both tanks and so I had two full tanks of gas and we went in and we bought candy and soda and we were just having such a good time being 
with each other and talking and, and, and buying soda. And we went out and we drove off. And I got home later and I was counting my money and I said, Shannon, I think I drove off without paying for that gas. I was so caught up in my conversation and I was so caught up in the moment and the lady behind the counter must have been captivated by everything we were saying because she didn't say anything either and I drove off and I didn't pay for the gas. So later that afternoon, I drove back over to the convenience store and I walked in and sure enough, the same lady that had waited on me was still there and I went up and I said, Ma'am, I think I drove off earlier and forgot to pay for my gas. And she nearly started crying. Did you know that if you are a convenience store attendant, or at least for this particular company at the time that this happened, and someone drives off without paying for gas, it comes out of your paycheck? Did you know if you walk a ticket at IHOP, your waitress might chase you down in the parking lot because <laughs> she or he pays for that meal? This lady looked at me and she said, I don't know if you realize it, but I would have had to have paid for your gas if you hadn't come back and the amount that it was was equivalent to a full day's pay for me. Wow. She was really, really glad to see me because you don't search everywhere for a dime but for a day's pay. That's different. And my commentary suggested that the money, the dime, the coin, the one-tenth that the woman had lost was the equivalent of a day's pay. But whether she had lost a dime or whether she had lost a day's wages, we may not know, but we do know this, that once it was recovered, she threw a party. She called her friends, and I don't know the size of the party, and I don't know what she spent, but she celebrated, and I'm sure even if it was a dime. And you know how I know? Because if you're looking for that dime, and, and you've got to have it to buy a pack of cigarettes, you'll be so glad when you got it, you'll call someone, and they'll come over, and you'll share a cigarette out of your pack with them, and you guys will sit there smoking going, I can't believe I found that dime. Oh, thank God. And if it's a six-pack of beer, <laughs> or if it's the money to get a keg at the party, you know you're going to share that. And if it was something for your baby, if it was food or medicine or health care for your child or for someone you love, you are definitely going to celebrate that. You see, I don't know that it's important, the size. I just know that it's important, the value of what is lost. It doesn't matter the dollar amount. It is the value of what is lost that Jesus, that Luke wants us to understand. Craddock says that this table, this communion service, should indeed be a celebration because what we celebrate at this table is that something was lost and now that something is found. At the end of this text, it says that over the repentance of one sinner, all of heaven throws this great and giant party. The rejoicing is more than you can, you can imagine. Here at this table is evidence of the value of what God is seeking out in our lives, in my life and in your life. The value is so great to God that God is willing to pay any price to find what was lost. It is right to celebrate. It's right to risk. Really? This is the kingdom of heaven. Really? 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 That you would leave 99 others alone in the wilderness, vulnerable, who knows what danger waits as soon as the shepherd's back is turned and go in search of just that one. I've had the question asked for me so many times 
Do you do it? Do you risk the entire budget of the church over one project or over one small expenditure? I don't know. I'm not an accountant. I've never been a treasurer in anybody's church or any other organization. Any money I ever had slipped through my hands faster than you can imagine. I don't know. It's a good question. I've had people ask me, do you risk the whole class? Do you risk the whole ministry over one child who won't respond or won't play with the others? Do you stop the whole thing for the sake of one, I don't know. I've never, I've never ran a daycare. I've very seldom taught Sunday school when everybody didn't sit up and pay attention to what I asked them to. So I don't know the answer to that. I'm just a preacher. I just hold the text up for you to consider. I can only tell you what I think. And I think... It is foolish to risk 99 for the sake of one. I'm apparently a greater utilitarian than I ever knew. But Luke, remember Luke. Luke is written for and written by and edited by the poor, the marginalized. And it's like... These, this audience of people are screaming at us today going, hey, do you understand? I count. I matter. You didn't notice me in your hurry to reclaim the 99, in your hurry to pocket the nine coins. You didn't notice me, but according to Jesus, God noticed me. That is the mathematics of the kingdom of of heaven and how counter to the way that we often think you leave it all you leave it all you risk it all because of the value of what was lost have you seen Gladys this is my daughter have you seen Gladys I used to tell this story that we when we played out on the road a lot, and, and you travel, and you don't get a chance to meet people. And so you give people nicknames, you know, uh, so that when you're back in the motel later and you're laughing and enjoying the, the afterglow of everything that happened to you this evening, you can refer to people, you know, big guy with beard, funny dancer guy, you know, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> so we made up names for people, and there was a girl that we made up a name for, and and she was always there, and she was always uh, in another world, in another reality. At first, we thought she was drunk, so we made up names about being drunk. And then we decided that she was just um, very star for attention, so we made up names about her sexual prowess, maybe. One day... This girl without a name, who had acted so strange for so long, came up to me. And why she picked me out of this big crowd, I have no idea. Because, I don't know, maybe we said something about Jesus sometime or another. I don't remember. But I wasn't there to preach. I wasn't there to sing gospel music. It was a different gig. And she came up to me on a break. And I thought, oh, boy, if the guys in the band see me talking to her, man, my reputation is going right down the tubes now. But she came up. And she had that picture. She said, this is my daughter. She left home when she was 16. I haven't seen her in four years. She was very angry when she left. I was very angry when she left. We said horrible things to each other. And I don't know where she is. I don't even know if she is alive. Will you pray for my daughter? I said, yes. I will pray for your daughter. She said, here, take the picture. I said, no, 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 that's your picture. You need No, she insisted. I want you to have this picture. This is my daughter. So I put it in the bottom of my little guitar box that keeps all my strings and tools. I remember one day my wife looking through there going, hmm, (laughs) whose picture do you have here? And I'm like, (laughs) it's an amazing story. One day, one night, She came back up to me at the same gig many, many months later. And I was able to give her the picture back because she said to me, 
my daughter came home. My daughter came home. Just one day out of the clear blue sky, she stopped by, and, and we're, we're talking, and we're, and we're moving kind of slow. Things are a little unsteady at times, but she's at home. She's working, and we're doing the best we can. I don't remember either one of their names. I wish that story had had way more value to me when it happened than the immeasurable worth that I see in it today. I forgot to learn their names. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes you risk it all because of the value of what you see. This in closing, when you consider Jesus, when you consider Jesus' divinity and who God and Jesus are in relationship to one another and who Jesus represents to the greater world, the salvation of God, the mercy and the forgiveness of God, I like these parables. I like these stories the best. Maybe because this is how I best understand Jesus. It reminds me that justice and, and value in the kingdom of God are not always what I have predetermined to be in my world. But it reminds me of something else, and it is this. There's a lot I don't know. You would do well to remember that also. There is a lot that I don't know, like... What is God like and what would God do? So I rely upon Jesus for revelations. And I don't really know what heaven is like. I trust that it is, it is greater than, than a great reunion or a banquet. It is, it is more than I can imagine. Perhaps it is a place where, where there is cognition, where there is memory. I don't know. Perhaps it's a place where I'll know my grandmother and see her again. And perhaps it's a place where, where I can sit and ask some of the great characters of the Bible, questions I've always had. Perhaps it's a place where I can even approach the very presence of God with all of my questions. I don't know what heaven is like. But if I believe these parables, this is what I believe. That if there is cognition, if there is memory, if there is a thinking mind in heaven, that once we are there and assembled and we take a survey, we peruse the landscape, taking in and beholding everything of beauty and truth that God has ever created, every person that God has claimed, every person that God has loved. And if we were to find in that great place that one piece, one person was missing, I believe that we would organize the greatest search and rescue mission in the history of time itself. After all, isn't that what we see in the coming, the dying, the resurrection, and the reclaiming that Jesus presents us with. Thank God. Now I know why they call it good news. And it is good. Will you pray with me?